Hello, my name is Austin Belzer, and welcome back to the Austin B Media Podcast. Today, I'm going to be discussing I Used to Be Funny with the longest-running podcast guest I've had, Alicia uh, Schaffens. I probably got that wrong again, but uh, it's your fourth <laughs> time here. Which ones have we done together? Uh, Barbie, Barbie Spoiler, Envy Season 1, and we didn't do The Boys Season 4 like we were going no, to. We that was just a scheduling it. issue. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think this makes four, yeah. Yeah, but um, oh, and Ted Lasso, so oh, five timers club, baby. Ted Lasso, <laughs> five times. So yeah, uh, go go buy our book, uh, the Ted Lasso Guide to Relationships. Um, I have a link to it on my website. Just search Ted Lasso podcast discussion. I'll link all of the um, times she's been on the podcast here before. I don't have a special purple jacket SNL style, <laughs> but so all I can offer is a welcome back to the podcast. That works. Yeah, that's all I can offer. I, I don't get much. But so for those of you, for those listening or watching who somehow don't know of you by now, let's catch people up on what you've been working on recently. I know you published, uh, what was it, Beetlejuice Beetlejuice review this morning? Yeah, yeah, just just recently did that. Usually, yeah, I usually have uh, two reviews a week. I write for a newspaper in Morgantown, West Virginia, and... Uh, so yeah, like my website, my Substack is MacGuffin or Meaning, and I uh, can just find that at elisechafins.substack.com. But yeah, regular, regular updates, at least twice a week, and maybe a little more than that, depending on if we're in like film festival times, um, or I just happen to see an extra thing that I really love and had to write about. So, and speaking of, uh, you know how we start. We always start with a recommendation. What is something you've either seen, listened to, what have you, or even read recently that you'd really yeah. recommend? So I'm going to recommend an upcoming thing uh, coming to Apple TV. Disclaimer is phenomenal. Mm, yeah. I have I have a review of that uh, on my site. It is excellent. It comes out October 11th. Definitely check it out. It's really, really great. Kate Blanchett, Kevin Klein, Sasha uh baron cohen i mean it's it's really excellent like all phenomenal performances yeah great 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 uh limited series so now correct me if i'm wrong is that uh directed by alfonso Cuaron? Yeah, yeah yeah it's it is yeah children of men so like excellent i it looks fantastic like mm, it's just really really well done so it, it's probably my top recommend and also i just finished the penguin last night that comes out on uh hbo and max in a couple September weeks 19th. i think on the 19th yeah so i can't say anything about it quite yet tomorrow i will have some thoughts about that show though <laughs> yeah uh that's awesome um I don't know if I've talked about this on the other podcast I just had with uh, Max Vincent. When was that? That was for um, Deadpool and Wolverine. That was for mm, Deadpool yeah, and Wolverine. Yeah. But in case I haven't already recommended it, I would recommend a, a Disney Plus doc uh, people aren't talking about. Uh, it's a National Geographic documentary called um, Billy and Molly, uh, the real life otter story or something like that. I think it's just called Billy and Molly or something like that. It's like how it sounds. A um, guy named Billy from Shetland who can't have kids of his own. Some one day a uh, baby uh, otter, a uh, river otter, uh, just ushers up on his little like uh, porch thing, his little dock he has by his, um, he has a seaside cabin um, mm. with his wife. Um, and it just washes up there, no sign of the mother. And it's about him caring for him, for the otter uh, named Molly um over the years and what that what the relationship is to each other whether and it questions whether or not the, the the relationship is good for one another um mentally physically every sense of the term it's probably one of the better nat geo docs i've seen recently now granted nat geo docs are amazing but, um but this one just blew me out of the water i just Happened to open Disney Plus, and I was like, you know what? I really want to catch up with this one, and it did not disappoint. And for those who don't know, my high bar of documentaries, this is this surpasses the bar. Like Ooh. I've really watched some really bad documentaries this year um, <laughs> that I'll be talking about, but um, I highly recommend it. I think I rated it five stars on Letterbox. Um, 
and I'll have an exclusive review for uh, patrons near the end of the month. I think September 26th is what I'm aiming for. Um, so uh, look out for that, but I, I loved it. Uh, I absolutely loved it. Um, and speaking of, um, let's talk about uh, our movie uh, yeah. today, which is uh, I Used to Be Funny, which stars uh, Rachel Sinat. Um, I think she's the only star that really you can even mention because it's so much focused about her. Um, yeah, Jason, Jason Jones is of some note since he was on The Daily Show for a really long time. Um for some maybe older people, because he's probably not been on it for a minute, but he was one of the correspondents back in the day. So got it. Yeah. And I do really quick want to uh, issue before we get into our discussion, a real quick uh, trigger warning for anyone who's dealt with um, violence, anyone suffering from PTSD, um, sexual abuse, any of those things. I really want to just kind of um, make sure we talk about that before we get Mm -hmm. into it because we are going to talk about that um specifically when we get into the spoiler session uh, of the movie but yeah the this film has heavy heavy themes uh i think depression is one of them ptsd is one of them but there's a lot of intense themes so if that's something that may be potentially triggering for you just turn it off and turn this podcast off maybe go listen to my deadpool and wolverine discussion or <laughs> uh, or one of our discussions with uh barbie or or gen v season one um maybe we'll do a gen v season two a discussion in 2027 i don't know it depends on when that comes <laughs> out but um but yeah look towards the more lighthearted ones because i've got plenty out there uh but, sure. but this is going to be a pretty serious and I don't want to say sobering discussion, but that tends to be the first word that pops in my mind uh, when yeah. discussing this movie. So with that said, um, let's get into our discussion of I Used to Be Funny. First, I want to talk about Rachel Sinat's performance because she's doing something different here, at least in terms of the roles I've seen her um, in. You know, bodies, bodies, body, bottoms mm -hmm. are, are the two that come to my mind, but I'm right. sure there's more I'm not thinking of where she's inherently more comedic and yes i know the title is i used to be funny so there's that funny in the title and there are comedic bits where uh, oh, for sure. that side of rachel comes out but this is a much more serious movie i would say so do you feel that that shift to a more dramatic tone was effective for her particularly when we're talking about her friend's intentions and trying to communicate that to her friends who may not understand what she's going through. Yeah, for sure. I think, I mean, I'll be honest, the comedian does dramatic role is often some of my favorite, like that's not a genre of movie, but it kind of could be like my, one of my favorite Will Ferrell movies is, you know, the fiction one. And all of a sudden my brain just went. True than out. fiction? Something like uh, that? Yeah, something. But like, that one, you know, Truman Show. And, you know, I mean, we saw Robin Williams do tons of these kind of movies. And, like, I think there's just something in that, that shift between comedy. I think the line between comedy and drama is just really thin. And sometimes they can be just, like, those kind of actors can be really effective in these more, these darker kind of roles. And I think she... Mm -hmm does a really fantastic job. I think a lot of times you see that like later in comedians careers. And obviously this is a much younger woman, but I think that she handles it really, really well. And I think it's impressive because this film is kind of told in this like dual time. Um, and so we're going between prior to the event and after the event kind of things and just to watch her body language and I mean the film just we'll get into the cinematography itself oh yeah as well but just her performance she has to carry this person who's like energetic and hopeful and excited doing all these things and then also this role of this person who's experienced this like horrible violation and how do you like go through from that and it's just I think it's just really, I think her performance is exceptional in this, honestly. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree. Um, I don't have much to add to that other than I I think I think this role for her came at the perfect time for me because while watching Bottoms, bot, oh, not Bottoms, 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 <laughs> Bottoms, I, I loved it, 
right? And I love Body's Body's yeah. Bite. I love all of her work, but something I come up against is I, I, I think she, at least to me, she comes off as like, I just want to be funny just to be funny when maybe a situation doesn't call for it or maybe it's just like too zany for my liking because she can definitely get zany really quick. Um, I agree. Especially in the podcast bit and Body's Body's Body. But yeah, I, I just love the balance because because I, I do think it's more about balance when we're talking about this movie where, yeah, it it, it is a funny movie. There are jokes mm. I genuinely laughed at and some I felt guilty about laughing about, but it felt more reserved and more like, oh yeah, somebody going through this situation would have that reaction as opposed to, let me just be funny because I this is a comedy and I really need to be funny right now. So yeah, I... So not much to add to that, um, because I, I do think Sanat, uh, Sanat um, is a great actress, a uh, great actor, period. And I'm thrilled to see that her, uh, I think she got a pilot just picked up by HBO, and she's going to be in Saturday Night, uh, formerly called, like, not the 1975, I think it was just called, like, something 1975. Is she like playing SNL, uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, that feels like who she'd probably play, but yeah, I mean she's phenomenal like and i yeah i'm with you i think she's gonna be uh, i am very excited to watch her career yeah and i guess what i'm trying to say is it's the perfect breather between like hey here's a dramatic role between what i'm i can only assume are gonna be like just balls to the walls comedies right uh especially in the case of saturday night live or saturday i keep saying saturday night live i just Saturday night. But I mean, they should release that on a Saturday night, but I digress. Like maybe release it an hour or two before Saturday night uh, that week. But uh, getting uh, to the more technical elements. Actually, no. Let's see. What would you like to talk about next? The relationships, pacing, relatability, or authenticness? Oh, let's talk about the relationships because I think they're, I am always a story guy. That's always going to be like my like thing that I kind of like hone in on first whenever I'm watching a movie is if you tell me a good story, even if other elements maybe aren't as impressive, I'll probably still really like it. So, and I think the story in this is really well done. I think her friend, I think the way that they kind of interact with her uh, and particularly her boyfriend partner, that yeah. relationship in particular, yeah, Noah is probably one of my favorite on-screen things I've seen in a film that deals with like, yeah, like a sexual assault and the trauma that kind of results from that. So yeah, like that, I, I just think it was, it was just really well done because I think we just see a woman who goes into like total avoidance mode, you know, following yeah. that. And I think the way that her friends are there to like support her is interesting i think the way that they handle that that yeah i i think it's just really good but yeah i mean feel free to share your thoughts on that yeah i think the friendships and, and relate the how it um portrays relationships in this movie are fascinating right because you have her friends trying to be this as supportive as they re realistically can without trying to enable destructive behavior i think at one point um, um, Max, Rachel Sonat's character, is talking about like online shopping and how much she's online shopping. And then uh, one of her roommates is like, okay, but uh, can you like help out with full rent? Or, <laughs> or I, I don't know if that's the joke, but, but it, it, it struck me as like, oh, wow, they're really trying to, like I said, try to give her the space to deal with, with what she's dealing with without uh, giving her an excuse to just kind of switch off from the world would be how I put it. And as far as like relationships, like we'd mentioned Noah, I think he's also trying to do that without getting into spoilers, um, obviously. But um, I, I think, and I think it speaks to the main part of the film where I think they're trying to, or at, at least I think that they're trying to say that you can uh, hold space for the, for the people who are going through things that you don't understand, but also you really need to be on them because there's a different part of this story where if they had these friends or family or 
well, I guess family isn't even brought up in the movie. Um, Not particularly, yeah. But um, these relationships, whether uh, friends or relationship, they're not giving other space to just shut down. And, and I think right. there's a version of that story where she does shut down and retreat into herself. And I think that's something we see in real life far too often. Yeah. Is friends not knowing what to do with somebody dealing with really intense emotions that they don't know how to deal with themselves. So. Yeah, I think that's true is like i don't know that her friends necessarily always do the right thing yeah or say the right thing but i think that's one of the things that actually works is they don't just not say anything then and i think that's what makes it like really well written to me anyway in that in that regard is yeah even if this thing happens to this person that you love there's still you, even if you're going to mess up and you probably will like engaging with them is still better than just ignoring it entirely. And I think they thread that needle really well, like with her friends. Yeah. They're, and it's all a group of comedians. I mean, yeah. her, her boyfriend, ex-boyfriend is a comedian and her two roommates are comedians. And so you have this group of like basically four comedians. And so you like, they're gonna say things that are this weird dark kind of whatever but they they push her there they push her without like pushing too much it's it's always offered hey do you want to come do a set or hey do you at least want to come to the comedy club and watch us do our thing and maybe you can get up and try maybe it's time to start working again you know and I think they just I really appreciated that about it that there's never this just total disengagement from her and just kind of yeah the letting her stew it's just really yeah honest in a way that i think is also instructive to to people like who are watching who might know somebody who's been through something like that yeah for sure and then um jumping off of that um i think a large part of this uh movie is how I, i think how it either dies or succeeds is off of its relatability because i think And uh, I think the film really tries to weave these narrative threads of like, hey, if you can relate to this, you'll really um, connect to the story in a way that you maybe you weren't even expecting to. So uh, I just want to ask really briefly or as longly as you want to answer, were there specific moments or elements that felt relatable to you and what made them work? Um, And how does it relate back to the message of the film? So I think... One of the most relatable scenes to me, and I hope this doesn't get too into spoiler. There's a scene where she is talking. She's a nanny for Jason Jones's character, for Cameron, and uh, for his daughter, Brooke, who's, I don't know, like low high school, I think like 13, 14 kind of age is the Mm. age I think. I can't remember exactly, but younger, like sub 18. But anyway, there's a scene where she goes out and Cameron is like grilling and he's a police officer and two of his like cop buddies are there with him. And she goes outside. Basically she's just kind of like saying, Hey, I'm going to dip. I'm heading home or whatever. And they kind of like bring her into this conversation. And it is this deeply uncomfortable kind of situation where she's there and she's significantly younger than them like you're probably Mm -hmm. talking about a lot of people in their 40s and she's in her 20s or you know upper 30s whatever but like she is younger and she's the only woman in this group of men and men with authority and she there's this kind of you can see this both discomfort but also so she diffuses that with like humor and kind of like jokey jokes with these people and I felt like that is something even though nothing that she goes through I'm not a comedian I am not like in her situation I've never experienced what she does but that situation right there is relatable I think for a lot of people of like oh I'm the only person in this group and I am deeply uncomfortable here and you can see I think that discomfort but also just the way that she uses her discomfort and like kind of uses humor to diffuse that and kind of make it, she's just one of the guys. And I think that scene in particular is just, yeah, it's really well done and it plays really well later in the film as well. Um, yeah, so yeah, like that, that. Yeah. I think that 
scene in particular is probably one of the things that I think is something that even if you haven't experienced a lot of the other themes that this film talks about, that can be relatable to a lot of to a lot of viewers. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the that scene specifically because it is the I think thesis for the movie. That's the point yeah. where you decide. I, I, I think it's a jumping point where you decide if if this film is for you or not. Um, mm-hmm. And I mean, there are some exit points earlier on in the movie where you could be like, oh, I didn't like, I don't like the, the roommates. They really uh, are irritating to me. Look off of Netflix um, or wherever you're watching it. Um, but this is the true like last stop before you really get to the, I, I believe the meat and potatoes of the film where, yeah. um, where some more distressing things happen. Um, but yeah, mentioning that scene is it, it perfectly portrays the message of the film. Uh, like we talked about color, and we'll talk about color here soon, and we'll talk about music later on. But uh, at that, it, it's a very colorful film and a very uh, music-driven film. And you'll notice all the color drains out of the the uh, picture. Well, not all color because you know can't be black and yeah. white, but um, and there's no set music except for stuff happening way in the background. Like it's very muffled so- sounds. And so, yeah, uh, all the music and uh, color virtually goes out of the frame. And we're presented with a very uncomfortable situation. And not that I've ever been in that situation, but I know what it's like to feel uncomfortable. And I think the film does a really good job at just, m- it, even if, it's not relatable uh, to you. I think it. That's the scene is where the point where it makes it relatable is mm-hmm. okay. You may have not been in a scene uh, situation where three police officers are bringing up um, your comedy videos or um, or a, a au a au pair or something like that. I think is yeah. what she <laughs> describes her as uh, describes right. herself as uh, instead of a nanny, right? And you know, or any of the situations that um, Brooke finds herself in. But that's the um, scenario uh, or the scene where I think it the, the film makes its point known, where it makes it relatable to the viewer. Um, so while I didn't connect with a lot of what was going on, that's the point where I'm like, okay, now it makes sense. And I forget the director of this. I don't know why my brain is saying Aliyah Shakwat, but because I know yeah. that's not right. <laughs> Yeah, right. Not right. Uh, I think it's Ali Paknu. Yeah, that's right. But that I, I think Panku, sorry. Yeah, and I think she really does a great job of translating that to the viewer to mm-hmm. make it very plain uh in all the scenarios where that feeling uh kind of bubbles up. And I think we'll talk about that specifically when we get to cinematography and the music and other things. But I just yeah. really appreciated that because there have been movies like this that I've watched that, you know, me being who I am, uh, didn't really understand because the director didn't make me understand Mm -hmm. uh, that feeling. Um, Which, you know, another film we talked about, Barbie, uh, did another really good job of. But um, yeah, yeah, I I think it, uh, in terms of relatability, I think it makes it relatable relatable to anyone watching. But with that said, I know we've been talking a lot about stylistic choices. So let's just go back to the like hi cat. Yes, I know I haven't pet you in the last two minutes. <laughs> um but going back to you know, we've kind of been dancing around this. Uh color is used a ton in the film. Yeah. Um, what did you think of the uh cinematography, the camera work, color palette, you name it. Like just go off. Yeah, I mean I think it delineates really well between basically these two timelines and where you see her. Um, yeah. Like you have this in the aftermath, everything's yeah. It's really desaturated and like much a darker tone kind of a, I think you mentioned like a bluish kind of tone over it. And then, yeah, like even just the way the camera is. And I think I was reading like an interview with, uh, with the director and she said that she really wanted everything in the after to be just this very kind of like 
stasis kind of thing of like everything's very flat so anything that's recorded where she's having like conversations with her roommates after it's just really flat there's not a lot of motion and she's like i kind of wanted to have that energy up a lot more in the before time so you see the camera kind of swirl around and everything i mean not swirl around i don't want to make it it's this is not one of those i'm gonna feel sick watching it kind of things but there's a lot more motion and like yeah like handheld kind of stuff versus you know like placed camera and i think yeah you can really feel the energy between that even if everything was stripped out i think you could kind of vibe it out just by literally watching the film to kind of see what's happening and i think that's just really effective filmmaking as well yeah i think it was the first time i've really noticed the uh, use of gels and uh, for those who don't know what gels are it's like a i think it's like a color you can put in front of a um either a lens or a light to change the color of the of the uh, light without using LED. Although I'm sure LEDs were used here because it's probably cheaper. But, um, it's the first time I've noticed anything like that. You know, you mentioned uh, in my notes, I made um, mention of like blues and yellows and some green. It, it, it really stood out. I, I think going back to what you said about like just watching the movie, I think you could listen, not even listen to this movie. You could hit the mute button on mm -hmm on your uh, TV or wherever you're watching. And I think you'd still get the same movie. You'd still understand the basic visual language or narrative of what's going on in the movie without even like um, eating, needing any audio. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll talk about audio very soon. Uh, but <laughs> because I, I noticed a few things, but, um, but yeah, I, I think the cinematography is, really fantastic for this and it's not like somebody you know but like it, it just i don't know it just really stood out to me it, that's like the beginning and end it really stood out to me the color grading was amazing like there's one shot very early on in the film where it transitions from her world being very very blue and then you see a yellow uh light pouring in through the window and then the whole frame turns yellow um around her it, it's fantastic color work uh, i don't mm -hmm. know if that's color grading or gels or leds whatever that was i'm excited to see whatever the the color scientist and whatever the cinematographer does next because that was fantastic yeah and speaking of fantastic the playlist on this <gasps> was fantastic so we've got good. like muna uh japanese house was the first that was the first note I made. It's like, what, what, what was the first song? Um, I don't know. I just remember Phoebe Bridgers coming in and I'm like, oh. <laughs> the first song was Something Has to Change by the Japanese House, which is, right. which if you, any, anyone has looked at my monthly little uh, Instagram stories I put out, they're constantly on my, uh, in my, my top 10 for most listened to artists. That's changed because of Sabrina Carpenter, but that's, uh, release bias but i love this th this playlist whatever whatever the music supervisor was doing i absolutely love because it was it, i feel like they stole my spotify playlist from my spotify account and said hey we're just gonna put make this music specifically for you austin and all the people who love muna phoebe bridgers i know there's some other artists like allison pontier um mm -hmm. in, in there too but um, those are so just a few I noticed. What did you think about the music? Oh no, it's fantastic. And it like, I think it speak it feels very much like the kind of like this is I do not want to sound reductive, but like if I had no, but if I'm like listening to my like sad girl playlist kind of thing, this felt very what I would have on it, you know? Like I I I love it. I think it sets the tone for the film beautifully. Like, oh, it's so I agree. The music supervisor did an exceptional job putting this soundtrack together. It is, yeah, it's one of my I, I I agree. It's one of my favorites from a film because I think it it also tells a story. Yeah, like outside of just yeah, the actual dialogue, which I also think is quite good. <laughs> like, I like all the elements, but you could take any 
single element and I think it works to tell the story pretty much as well as all of them combined like I, yeah I think just listening to the soundtrack you would also get a really strong sense yeah. of this movie yeah yeah and specifically calling out the first song something has to change which I've listened mm-hmm. to I, I don't even want to look up how many times I've listened <laughs> to that literally the lyrics um for like I think four or five lines is just the word something has to change something has to change right um, it, it's that other aspect of storytelling like you were saying we, you know we talked about color telling a story we talked about uh, the comedy and the relationships telling its own story I think the music you know just very plainly lays out here is what's going on in case you are not getting the message right and also plus one for diegetic music I mean there are some right. yeah. cases where it like kind of transitions into the typical like overblown um montage style um uh soundtrack uh stuff but most of it is diegetic yeah yeah uh meaning in universe or in the universe of the film it it's like playing in the background or something yeah it does it does a good job of that yeah no it's it's great yeah. Although I do question somebody having a radio in like 2020, whenever this <laughs> takes place. I'm right. Like, oh, okay. Like <laughs> maybe if you have like an iPod in the corner, I would understand that like, or iPhone connected to like, a, you remember the iHomes? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> like I, I would understand that, but like <laughs> radio, someone in their 20s, I, I mean, at that point, vinyl would be more reliable, uh, more, uh, more, uh, <laughs> more relatable uh, to get back to that work word. But um, and then I know you briefly mentioned the dialogue, so let's talk about that. How, what did you do think of the dialogue, especially when it kind of goes into the more serious or emotional topics that naturally this uh, film talks about? Yeah. Natural uh, or feel stilted or I, I mean I think it works really well personally you know I wish I was as funny as that even in my saddest days but you know for the most part I really feel like it feels pretty pretty realistic it's not it's not that like kind of mumble core where you have all the ums and everything and so it feels very realistic it doesn't have that kind of vibe but it does have a natural flow to it I feel like these are conversations I could see happening yeah. with people. I, nothing felt outside of mm, nobody ever talks like that kind of thing. But it do, and it doesn't go into that Wes Anderson or like Quentin Tarantino conversation where it's so snappy or really you know very very wordy and clever and all of that. It's it's not that. It hits a a far more natural kind of dialogue and I thought it I thought it worked everything felt real to me even even with Brooke I thought the conversations we haven't talked a lot about Brooke but the conversations between Sam and Brooke I think are also they felt real to me like I could see a 20 something au pair talking to her 15 something year old you know kid in that way, in this, I'm older than you, but I'm also kind of relating to you as a person and understanding that you're not an adult, but you're also not a little kid. And I felt like that felt real as well. Yeah, I I, I would have to agree. Um, I don't have much more to add, except for maybe the only time where the dialogue felt unrealistic is, and maybe it's not unrealistic more so that I had a like a I was kind of squirming in my seat problem um, was when the two, uh, when, uh, when Brooke and um, Max uh, are talking about Twilight and it, it, to the dad, it just felt very, maybe because I wasn't like in talking about Twilight at the time, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but that felt very unnatural. It's like, Hey, maybe don't mention this team Jacob stuff in front of the dad, you know, some social context clue may, might've, <laughs> might've told you that maybe don't mention that, but, or maybe that's the point, but um, as we'll get into later. Right. But, uh, but yeah, I, 
and to talk about Brooke and uh, Max's re- relationship. Max or Sam? I thought she it's was Sam. Sam. It's Sam. Yeah. I, no, that's okay. <laughs> um, I don't know why I have Max in my head. Maybe because I was talking <laughs> about the Deadpool and Wolverine conversation. Um, but, but yeah, it, it it felt. I don't think there was at at any point where it felt unnatural. And I do think, mm-hmm. again, like you said, Sam, uh, Sam and Brooks. Uh, relationship felt very natural where it starts from this point of clashing with it, one another to what can we connect on and then okay how can I mentor you and then whatever what it ends up happening um which I won't spoil because I think it's um something you need to see for yourself see it on Netflix if you've got Netflix or yeah. just rent it maybe maybe the Maybe the maybe uh, the director gets more royalties that way. I don't know. I don't know how any of that works. I don't know. Uh, um, and then final question before we kind of go uh, in depth into the spoiler discussion, I want to talk about the pacing of the film, uh, especially to- when we get towards that uh, third act. Mm-hmm. Um, did it work for you? Did it felt? Did it ever feel too rushed or anything like that? No, I thought it. I think it is. I mean, I I really, really love this movie with some exceptions to the very end, which I think we'll probably talk about in maybe the spoilery section. But no, like, I think the structure of it works really well and it unfolds the story pretty brilliantly, I think. I really don't have any, like, yeah, I think the pacing is great. There is no point where I'm watching this movie where I was like, Oh, get on with it. Like, I didn't feel like I was looking at my watch and like, okay, get to the next part. It feels really, yeah, really well, well paced. I think I, I imagine, I don't know how much of that is the editor, how much of that is the director, but whatever, whatever they did, it works really, really well. I think I have, yeah, I think it's a pretty brilliantly, put together uh film as far as that goes this will be the first point we disagree on Mm, okay (laughs) i think i think it suffers a really uh rubber band um Mm. the closer you get to the end of the movie um and not spoiling anything um there it but because of the two timelines i think it really it at least for me it confused me a lot about Mm. what what was happening at any given moment like i almost felt like i needed uh have you ever played like a story here are the choices you made and here are the here's how your decision changed this i needed like a a credit sequence (laughs) where it's like here's how here's the timeline and how each point connects to this Um, because i at at a few points i was confused what was happening now and what was Mm. happening then like even just like a little 10 days ago or whatever like what at like the bottom left or something would have been like, okay, cool. Um, on top of that, I think, um, the movie has a, has this B plot with Brooke that I don't think really works for me because it, it's all very hand wavy. Um, again, no spoiler. I I don't know how much I could say, but, um, it, it, it mentions it every few scenes and then like drops it immediately after and then brings it back up again drops it brings it up again drops it and i don't know maybe that's how um life works as you bring something up and it gets dropped but it felt very unnatural uh in in that way to me because there is a turning point where a character agrees to something and then a lot of the plot happens and then there's something else happens with that B plot. Yeah. Um, that really just kind of deteriorated the movie for me. It brought it down actually a couple of stars for me because the plot got so convoluted um, toward as we get towards the end of the movie and there's really not enough of a through line throughout the entire movie um, to support it being what it is at the end of the movie i'm trying to Mm. be as spoiler light as possible (laughs) but yeah i I almost felt like you could cut that out of the movie and not have it um affect anything i mean i know it's a major part of the movie but at the same time i'm like you could modify that to be like 
okay, well, it can be this instead, or it, you could, it felt interchangeable is I guess what I mean, mm. uh, because it wasn't very specific. I'm, I'm a, su- a sucker for, if you make something specific, you've got me, mm. uh, but if you make it un- in specific and only just like hand wave at that general plot of what that B plot is, it doesn't really excite me. Mm. Um, not that it has to be exciting, uh, right. but it, it just felt convoluted in some ways. I, to me, I felt like what happens with Brooke is something that is necessary for like Sam to be able to kind of move past her trauma is that is the situation that she can connect to that allows her to move to the next thing. Like she needs to have something like a project, I guess. And I think Mm -hmm. anytime somebody has a major trauma, there needs at some point there's going to, you can kind of like live there forever, but at some point there can be some kind of, I don't know, project or that's the word that kind of like is in my brain right now, but like that kind of thing, like some kind of thing that you can latch onto that I'm going to do this. That's kind of separate from my trauma. And this isn't really separate because we'll get into that later. Um, Yeah. We're really dodging left and right. Spoiler. (laughs) But she needs to do this thing for Sam, I think, because she needs to do this thing for herself. And so for me, that did work. I think it's maybe a little bit absurd. And like some of the specifics of what happens are maybe a little. But I think overall, it felt to me like the kind of thing that she could do that would allow, yeah, like I said, that would allow her to move on to the next thing that she, like, to move on with her life, basically. Because sure. there is no moving on, but there is the, okay, but now I can, like, function again. And I think she needed to do this thing in order to get to that next level of function. And I think, so for me, that worked. And I do agree, like, the end scene, like, the third act in particular can be pretty, but I felt, yeah. like, to me, it worked. I, I thought it worked pretty well. Um, the hardest part is there's a scene where she has this, they kind of show the immediate aftermath of the horror before they show the horror. And I feel like that can get a little bit confusing. Like yeah. I tracked with it. I tracked with it. Okay. But I could see that in particular because there's this immediate aftermath scene that happens. And then the like ugh, scene and like those two being flipped I, to me that works I think that is right as you're like merging these two and you have that kind of like cross thing that can be confusing but I, uh, to me it works but you know that's that's me so but I can I can see where for some that could be confused it, it reminds me kind of of um the musical uh the last five years which I think was also turned into a movie but it's basically these two stories that are told one starts at the end, one starts at the beginning and the, of this marriage that ends. And they kind of cross in the middle and then end on the other side where one person's just getting into this relationship and the other is getting out of theirs. It's a beautiful musical. Like it's worth to check it out. Worth looking up. Yeah. Um, I feel like maybe Anne Hathaway did the the musical version of it. I don't remember, but like it's yeah, it's really, it's a really interesting um story but yeah it so I think anytime you're doing this kind of like crossed timeline you're gonna run into some place where that gets confusing and so I can I can see that for me it worked but I can I can see where that's maybe a little much yeah it it, it was just all very like I I get which point you're talking about and we'll talk about it a little later uh because I feel like we're really buttoned up against that (laughs) spoiler Spoiler. but yeah I I agree. It just needed, I think, a little bit more. Maybe some editing to make it flow a little better. Um, So and in a dual timeline thing like this, it's like, I guess, a more recent example for me because I haven't seen Rashomon or what did you say? The fifth year? The last five years, I believe. The last five years. Um, I guess a more recent uh, thing is the Acolyte is Mm. where you have. Uh, hey, this thing happened in, in uh, the past. Now we're we have an entire episode 
devoted to telling you uh, the, a thing that happened in the past that you've already kind of learned about, but from a different perspective, but which this doesn't do. But anyways, I, I feel like we're really bumping up against spoilers. Yeah. So um, <laughs> without further ado, uh, I think we should just go right into it. So for those listening or watching, here's a quick heads up for uh, those who haven't seen I Used to Be Funny Yet. We're about to discuss the plot and unanswered questions from the film and just about anything. It, nothing's off limits. So if you prefer to avoid spoilers, you can skip ahead. I'll have a time code labeled. Uh, I don't know what it's going to be called, but it'll have some version of like final thoughts or social media plugs or outro or something like that. You'll find that in the episode description on uh, whatever you, wherever you listen to this or on YouTube or on my website, wherever. So just... Uh, click that you should be able to go right to it or scrub through your uh, episode player I, i'm not sure how each podcast player handles that but i anyway so so now that the spoiler warnings that there um i hope everyone who who is gone has not seen it has gone watch it on netflix if you've got it or rent it whatever you got to do so with that said let's talk spoilers um yeah. so there's a uh, scene in this movie, which I thought was very poignant. It's kind of another one of those thesis statements for the movie. Sam, the main character, goes into a bookstore. I'm guessing a local bookstore it didn't look like a Barnes & Noble to me. Uh, not that that matters. but um, And she picks up a book that's titled, like, M Moving in Circles. Um, and mentions something about becoming straight lines. I think the exact quote is, ah, here he is. The exact quote is, we keep moving in the same circles in the same ways that neurons circle atoms. We must become straight lines. And the uh, book title is Tapping Back In uh, by author Brianne Schmorden. I don't know if that's an actual book, mm. um, yeah. but it didn't look like a real book, if I'm going to be honest. It's a very fake book looking uh, cover. But um, so I want to talk about that. Did that quote... Uh, resonate you with you when you saw the film either on first watch rewatch and how do you think it's a good thesis statement for the film yeah i mean i think it's yeah again it's a pretty just straightforward kind of thing like after the assault she's just like goes around and around like it's really difficult for her to you know move past that there are people in her life that you know Anytime she sees them, particularly Noah, her, her, uh, her boyfriend and then ex-boyfriend. It's anytime she sees him, there is just this like connection to that event. And I think with her, like, yeah, in order to move past that circular kind of thing, she has to make these decisions to like, who's able to like, continue to be in her life, who has to be excised. And I think that's just really hard to do and I think the film explores that really well and it feels almost unfair Noah didn't do anything wrong he's wholly supportive he's really you know good to her and I think she sees that but there's just no he's just a part of a thing that she can't get past and like that's not anybody's fault and it just yeah, I just really appreciated the way that they, yeah, that it's dealt with. I think it's really difficult and poignant, as you said. I think that's a good word for it. Yeah, it really struck out to me in a way that, I, that, and and I think the movie has a lot of points like this where it's like, hey, this is the point of the film. Yeah, just for sure. Shoves it in your face uh, without being like overtly direct, but like also being like, here it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's a wonderful um, showcase for the film about like, hey, if in case you didn't get it, uh, here's another case of like, if you if the cinematography, if the music didn't do it for you, here's the character literally reading from a book called Tapping Back In. Right. So, uh, and I want to key in on something you said about Noah uh, because it's one of the more heartbreaking uh, scenes in the movie. Uh, there's conversation late on in the film about uh it's it's basically uh for lack of a better term a what are we conversation yeah and it calls back to um one of my favorite films of last year and i don't like to compare movies <laughs> i think if you're comparing movies in your reviews it, it, that's a very unique crutch to have 
but yeah, I, I thought it compared to la- past lives a lot where it's like, hey, we're heading in two separate directions and really, you know, another point where it's like, here's the thesis of the film. Here's what relationships look like post trauma and post event, I guess you, the more vague term for it. Um, yeah. So I guess my question is like, what do you think of that scene? Yeah, I mean, I, it is sad because, yeah, like I said, it's he didn't do anything wrong. Like, Noah is not the problem here. And, and she says that. I mean, really plainly. She's like, this isn't really about you. This is about me and about my trauma. And I can't. And, and I can see that. There is going to be, as a person who, you know, I mean, if your partner is violated there's going to be this feeling of why wasn't I able to stop that why wasn't I able to see it ahead of time whether it's you're a parent and something happens to your kid or it's a partner or whatever there's going to be this feeling of like responsibility that I wasn't able to make this not happen that that then kind of turns it into a story about you and it's not and she cannot be there as she's dealing with her own thing to help him process his feelings about not being able to stop it or not you know being able to be everything for her in the aftermath of this assault and like I think that's it's just this really difficult thing and I think it's it's written really beautifully in a way that I never felt like either of them is the bad guy. And I think they do that really well. I think that, uh, you know, the script really does that, does that well. And yeah, I, I think it's not a comparison that like came to my mind with past lives, but I could totally see that when they're on the, uh, they're doing their like zoom calls and she kind of is like, no, not, not now. But I think that it has that, it does have that same kind of vibe of like, neither person's wrong. It's just, this can't work for this time. Yeah. It's a mutual understanding of like, Hey, um, I tried to be there for you, but I couldn't deal with this thing that you were dealing with while also dealing with my thing. Um, right. so yeah, I think that puts it beautifully. So yeah. Um, Going further, I know we're talking, we kind of um, have been dancing around the whole idea of trauma, uh, this whole mm-hmm. podcast. So let's just address it. Um, how do you think the film portrays it? That is particularly the uh, complexity of this type of trauma. Do you think it's um, yeah. real, especially Sam's journey throughout all of it or does it oversimplify things? I mean, anytime you're looking at a film, there's going to be a level of simplification uh, just for portraying the story. But I feel like overall, it does a really solid job. Um, yeah, I I love that she doesn't show the actual assault. I think that is really great. Like, I think one of the first movies I ever saw that dealt specifically with like sexual assault was uh the accused with Jodie Foster way back like a 1980s movie I saw that in college and it is brutal and like almost fetishizes the actual like assault itself uh it's just really it's a really incredibly difficult film to watch I mean it's an important movie but I think it's it's really hard and this one she doesn't show anything I mean it's not like that but you sure know what happens and um I think that is done really well and I think that she did a really great job of like showing the aftermath of like how this shuts down and like there are parts where she just says it out loud to Brooke there's like a scene where she's just like I can't be funny anymore all I think about is this you know, event, it just consumes me. I can't work. I can't talk to my friends. I can't be with my boyfriend anymore. Like everything is impacted by this. And I think particularly in a time and, you know, here's somebody who has some kind of online presence. She has a YouTube channel that has, and they talk about it specifically. She has like lots of views on her stuff. And then her story, you know, a cop, raped her and she 
is that's obviously going to be in the news and then he it's a situation where she actually went and like did the thing and i mean we rarely know about these assaults unless there there is a court case and then we know everything and like so you have this young girl whose mom died and then her dad is out of the picture now he's in jail because he's you know sentenced and like she lashes out because at this person who she sees as maybe doing this for like for clout for you know for the views and like yeah uh, and I could see that settling in the mind of somebody who's a lot of their life is on you know TikTok or social media or whatever where yeah the whole deal is to get likes to get clicks and to see this and this situation happened to your family and be like, well, the only reason that you're doing this is for the likes it's for the clout and to have to like tell a kid, no, this ruined my life. This ruined everything. So yeah, it's said overtly, which, you know, maybe a lot of people never vocalize, but I think the way that they did that was done really well of they were able to vocalize it in a way that made sense without it just being expository. This is how it feels to experience trauma. Like, I think yeah. they did that really well. I think that the the script handled that aspect well. Yeah, I agree. I do think it gets overly simpl- simplified towards the mm-hmm. end of the film. Like that scene you talked about where it's just hitting you in the face with, no, Brooke, here's what's happened. I, I think it does get a little like, okay, that's a little... Uh, simplification of oversimplification of things yeah but, but at the same time you like you talked about brooke is of a different generation so maybe she just needs that like hard truth mm-hmm. um but um to go back to something you said earlier uh the fetish fetish fetishization of uh trauma i think that's something that really rubbed me the wrong way with a lot of fx shows mm-hmm. particularly um it was from a few years ago, a teacher or something like that, like that with an, um, I forget the kid's name from Love, Simon, but, um, uh, but with Kate Mara, it was on FX. They really go in that direction. And I'm glad this movie doesn't go in that direction because I think, I think it's trusting the audience to know what happened uh, Yeah, because they've already shown you earlier. It's like you're kind of out of sorts when it, when, you hear that about the aftermath earlier on in the film and you're like oh carbon monoxide detectors what is she talking about that <laughs> you know you're in brooks frame of mind so when it reframes it from um sam's frame of mind it's very plain but not in a but in a complex way if that makes sense yeah um it's it, it and i think um showing the court scene while i think I think at some points it does trend towards not, I don't want to say power fantasy because I don't think that's the right term to use here, but it does trend towards like, I don't know if that would happen in this situation, but, but like it, it's, it's not trying to be a courtroom drama. It's right. Yeah. Uh, it's just trying to say, okay, here's how she would react to this situation. Even if 100% the judge would like, uh, since her from some of the things she says in the movie but that's beside the point uh like just anyways that's getting beside the point but um i think it's very complex it's very the word that came into my mind um in the first five minutes before i even knew of any of the trauma that she was going through uh, uh, like i knew that there was trauma going on there but you don't know what it is until very late into the film um I think about midway, it, 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 the term in my mind comes across as humanistic. It's, mm-hmm. it, it's very uh, human when it comes to the trauma. It doesn't try to um, say, you know, we talked about fetish, fetishization, which is apparently a very hard word for me to say. I'm learning, which is okay with me. Um, but it, it could have leaned into that and really just mm-hmm. lost, the, lost the thread and maybe even turned into like a romantic dramedy between her and Noah or yeah, really tried to go South instead of left instead of right. Um, but I'm glad it went 
the way it did, for lack of a better phrase, um, yeah. uh, narratively. But speaking of where it went, let I just want to spend the rest of our time talking about Act Three because it's okay. what yeah. it's what really um, kind of turned me off of the movie. It was a real mm. disconnect from the rest of the movie for me. The film takes a notable, noticeable tonal shift um, with the rescue storyline, for lack of a better term. How do you think this affected the overall mood of the film? And do you think it adds or detracts from uh, the film as a whole? Yeah, so if you're watching, I'm going to assume that you've seen it, but just to like set it up, if somebody decides they don't care about spoilers. So basically at the end, Brooke, the, the film honestly starts with Brooke is this missing person. That, yeah. And we don't really know what her relationship to Brooke is. We know that Brooke is very pissed at Sam. Like she is angry. And that they've had an interaction at some point in this like four day time in which Brooke has been missing they have actually seen each other somewhere in the middle of that four-day time that the news is saying she's been out of pocket and so and and I think the way they kind of like get to that is is again like pretty well done but like you have this kid and I feel like the hardest thing so she runs away basically and she goes with this like bad boyfriend kind of person much older person to Niagara Falls to uh and he's like, I don't know, a drug dealer or something, whatever. Right. And I feel like that's the thing is I think that overall, I don't like hate it. I think it kind of works in that, yeah, you have these whatever. I I wish they had set up Brooke a little better as having yeah. these unsavory like ties that maybe sam is keeping her from and i don't feel like that is set up so that to me is the hardest sell of it but i think sam's need to go rescue brooke from this person does work because i think that sam like i said earlier i think sam needs this thing to do this you know rescue to be able to move on to the next thing of what she's going to do so like thematically i think it works i think story-wise it's maybe forced that would be my take on it. So it worked for me overall. But yeah, I do think that if there's any weakness in the script, that's probably it is. I think if we had had more understanding that Brooke had bad friends or the potential for bad friends, but Sam kind of steered her away from that. And then when Sam is out of her life because Brooke's dad raped her, you know, like that, that, made her go toward this way. I feel like that could have made that easier, but overall, yeah. I I still thought it worked personally. I agree with everything you're saying because we only get one scene really where uh, uh, Brooke, apparently I'm really struggling with names today, is hanging out with, I, I think that was Nathan earlier in like a- Maybe, a, maybe. Maybe. It's not really clear because we don't hear his name until like mm -hmm. much later in the film. So it's like, okay. And they make a point to talk to talk about the person providing the smear off, but like, and they mention her by name, but like, that's it. And it's mm -hmm. like, okay, well, oh, if this is the one thing that wouldn't really spell out to me that as a viewer that, oh, she's in Niagara Falls with a drug dealer boyfriend and is getting high off of his supply, quite literally. Like, I think she, I, uh, I, it doesn't say it explicitly, but um, it basically says that uh, Nathan's been forced drinking, uh, like putting something, some meth or, or something like that. Um, yeah, something. Yeah. Anyway, but I think, yeah, I think some tweaking there would have really been um, useful. And because it's like Sam is at this party and then just, I, I guess, looks at the Nathan name tag, I think. And, Maybe, yeah, yeah. And then just basically it cuts and then, oh, hey, here's some food and here's my car. And it's like, okay, I don't know if you're the same friends that were trying to not enforce her bad behavior. You're like, you're the little one selling her to let the Brooke thing just go and now you're fine with it? I, It was weird. Yeah. Um, 
absent of, I don't like like saying what a movie, but I'm this isn't an actual review, so um, I would have preferred uh, because this was coming up in my mind while watching the third act. I would have preferred that she goes to Niagara Falls, and it's not Brooke. Mm. Um, the person she thought was Brooke that came to her house that day maybe like was somebody else, and that maybe have a B plot where it's more about like, okay, has she imagined something in her mind so that she can have a purpose again? That would have been really strong, a strong way to end the movie. It would have been a downer of a <laughs> of a way to end the movie. And I think the movie very clearly wants to have that um uh happy ending. But I think it, this film would have worked better with that downer ending where it's like, no, mm -hmm. she, she just imagined that I mean I don't know, like, there would be some mental gymnastics to make it to where it's not broke, uh, and maybe it brings up some, some negative connotations where it where it'd be a commentary on, like, believability of, like, trauma survivors' stories changing, and I don't think that would have been great, so I don't know. Um, yeah, that would be my main thought there, is, like, I don't want to veer too much into like oh well she's just crazy lady you know and it feels like that could be the way that might be perceived and i think that would undercut the you know a larger theme of overcoming or moving through your trauma so that personally like i said i i think structurally story-wise it could have gone differently but i didn't i didn't hate the way it went personally so but I can I can see where you're saying, but I don't know. Also, I just I love the ending. I think it is entertaining, and yeah, I liked it. I, <laughs> the very very last scene, I I loved. So, <laughs> so I guess let's talk about that. Let's talk about Niagara Falls. It's yeah. a major setting towards the end of the film. Its symbology is a very big part of this movie. So I I want your. Uh, I want to know what do you think it symbolizes in the context of Sam's journey and how does it, how does that trip to Niagara Falls impact both Sam and Brooke? I mean, I don't know that we really get to see a lot of how it impacts Brooke outside of seeing a woman support her and come to her rescue and knowing that that is a thing that can still happen. And then, mm -hmm. and I think that, is a positive message but yeah like the the scene I mean I think just like the falls constantly going is uh, it just keeps going the trauma keeps going but also your life is going to keep going and you have to make these decisions as to how you're gonna yeah move forward and that the last scene is her on stage saying I'm gonna tell jokes about rape tonight I mean it's yeah it's this interesting kind of thing. I just, I, I think that's how particular, and that's where it gets back into specifics. I think that's how a lot of like comedians process their trauma. I mean, I look at somebody like Tignataro who went through like as a real person, mm -hmm. um, you know, went through the loss of her mom and like, going through C. diff and going through breast cancer and all of these things, like deeply traumatic, horrible things. And like, that's her act. And like, I just think that, yeah, I, so like, I think Rachel's not doing that I, feels authentic to her as a comedian. Like it felt like, oh, well, if that was her actual life, that's probably what would happen. And mm -hmm. I just, I, I thought that was really well done. And I mean, I just love hearing uh, the, I know the end at the mm. end of the film. Like, I mean, I love that piece. That's one of my favorite just pieces of music. I think it was in probably my like top 10 last year. I just, yeah. I mean, Phoebe Bridgers. I just, mm. yeah. But, but I think that kind of hits that same thing. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I really, I really dug it. Yeah. Um, so I have a very different take on what it meant. Right. I think, and this is going to sound cheesy, so don't roll your, well, you can roll your eyes if you want. Um, <laughs> I don't I have did, a great eye roll, so. Yeah. 
I do. <laughs> um, but uh, I think the Niagara Falls were what I would call a release point for her trauma. It's like, mm. okay, I have, ach- I have um, achieved the point of, of the trauma where I can accept what happened to me and now move on to the next phase of my life, whatever that looks like. And the reason I said that's corny is because it, the Niagara Falls are literally like a release point. But yeah, that's, yeah, as far as the other stuff, gosh, I don't really have a lot to add what, to what you said. You pretty much summed up what I thought about the film. I think we were pretty uh, a similar accord on this film. But yeah, I, I would love to see what this director does next. Um, Me too. I, I believe this was her like first feature. It was interesting because there was a large um, gap between the three release points of this movie. Now I've got release points in my head. Because I think it uh, debuted at South by Southwest 2022 or 2023. Yeah, I and think then, 23, yeah. And then came out this June mm-hmm. um, in theaters, and now it's on Netflix. So it's like, geez, that's a pretty large window. Now, granted, um, something like Butterfly in the Sky was at like Tribeca 2022 and just now hit Netflix um, this year. So there's been <laughs> wider ones, but... Um, but yeah, I, I I liked this film. I don't want to say I love the film. I, I love what it was trying to do. But I mm. think the third act really where, is where it starts to like take all the goodwill it had and just crumble apart at the seams. It took, I think, what would be a potential five star into like a three and a half or four star because it really just kind of lost its way for me at that point in mm. the third act. But, um, what would you rate, rate it? Oh, I'm pretty sure I gave it four and a half. I really, like, literally my save for five was I felt like, yeah, the story was not quite strong enough to support the the rescue. But past that, I I think it just, I think it does what it intends to do very effectively. So, yeah, I, I, I quite love this movie. <laughs> It's one that would not surprise me for it to be on a top 10 at the end of the year. At the very least, it'll get a an honorable mention for sure. So, but yeah, we're not quite into the end of the year. So we'll see. Yeah, this is definitely <laughs> going into my like directorial debut short list for the year. Yeah. Uh, for yeah. our IFCA awards that we're exactly. gearing up for, Woo! which feels so soon. But also right? Like, didn't we so just far do that? Away. <laughs> yeah, we, we did them in February. So, um, and... <laughs> Um, we're in the recruitment stages again, so um, yeah. um, I can't remember if we're closed on that, but I think ifccritics.wordpress.com, I believe is our URL. I'll include it in the uh, URL. So if you're a critic, you've seen 50 yeah. movies this year, I, I'd encourage you to apply, um, especially um, if I, I, I look, I, I really would appreciate some unique voices this year. I think we could really get some uh, unique voices out there. If you come from the US, I would actually, I hate to say this, I would actually discourage uh, you from applying because I think we need more international critics. As our name implies, International Film Society Critics Association. So I I wanna see more international critics come by and say, hey, what's up? Uh, Well, not hey, what's up, but I'd love to hear your (laughs) voice. So IFSC critic, critics.wordpress.com of all that in the episode description um on youtube wherever you listen to it or watch it on youtube i don't also think you could watch on spotify i don't know how that works anyways but um if you have anything you'd like to discuss about i used to be funny i'd love to hear your thoughts on my blue sky facebook instagram threads um, or letterbox i'm under the username austin b media i have my own discord which i have linked in the uh, episode description whether I just opened up uh, Patreon community chats. So, uh, well, not just, but uh, they added this feature called all member chats. So w- regardless if you join my Patreon for free or um, become a paid member, um, you can participate in those chats. Uh, and I usually link stuff. I've got like a Q&A corner. I've got a little uh, recommendations corner. 
got three or four of those that uh, love for you to take part in. But with um, if you'd like to hear the next episode before it goes live on podcast services, just check out the Patreon at patreon.com slash Austin B Media. Uh, $3 a month gets you a lot. Um, it gets you early access to stuff like this, uh, any editorial stuff, really, whether it be reviews, interviews, podcast episodes. And then if you upgrade to 10 bucks a month, you get unedited podcast episodes as well as exclusive podcast episodes. And you can also, um, I'll be opening up uh, I just got access to po- to the ability to sell posts and collection. So, uh, I'll be selling various posts and collections. So even if you're not a patron, you can still buy those and have access for as long as you have a, a Patreon account, I think. I don't know exactly how that works. But uh, if you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave a rating, review it on your favorite podcast app, like uh, Pod- Pocket Cast, Apple Podcast, I think Spotify Podcast, you can rate um, podcasts now. Thank you, Elise, for joining me and discussing I Used to Be Funny. Where can people follow you on social media? I'm just about everywhere at Elise Chaffins. Um, I'm most active on TikTok and Instagram because I'm old Facebook. So <laughs> those are the best places to find me. I'm on threads and other places, but my usage in other... <laughs> I, I, I have limited abilities to interact in places so yeah like yeah that's instagram but anywhere you can follow me there and be sure to check out my book the ted lasso relationship guide yeah very good but yeah if you ever join you know get on threads again just join us delulu people on thread but with that i have been uh your host austin belzer and until the next episode (laughs) 